so much for taking the time. Uh, Ayush is a research intern at Mass General. He is also an incoming freshman at Harvard University. Very passionate about his field and equally passionate about sharing his expertise and his knowledge with other students. So in addition to this webinar that you're seeing, if you go to the STEM Away main page and under the community contribution category, you will see a whole lot of learning resources that have been contributed by Ayush. We are really happy to have Ayush as part of our STEM Away student leader group. And thank you so much Ayush for hosting, over to you. Um, so I'm Ayush and let's get started with a quick overview of the talk for today. Okay, so our talk today will have three parts. I'll start off with a brief, a brief introduction and a hands-on guide to how to get started in student research. Then I'll give you a biology background, starting off with the basics, genes, DNA, and RNA, and building up to what is a transcriptome uh, of a cell or of a tissue. Next, we'll talk about how to do transcriptomics analysis, the basic lab-based steps that you need to do, and then the computational steps in the data analysis part of the talk. And finally, we'll end with a few examples of how what we've learned today can be applied to the real world. Uh, now, I encourage you to ask questions. Uh, there should be a Q&A box on your screen, and I'll take questions at the end of each section. Let's jump right in with the introduction. So who am I and why do I do what I do? I'm Ayush Nuri, uh, and I am very passionate about neuroscience research, specifically in neurogeneration. Um, my grandma suffered for over a decade um, from a rare neurodegenerative disease called progressive supranuclear palsy. And inspired by her, her struggle, uh, I endeavored to help solve these diseases. Of course, it's going to be a team effort, a massive team effort. So I hope that I can play a small part in contributing to uh, that work. I also work in the Institute for Neurogenerative Diseases at Mass General, uh, mentored by Dr. Sudesh Nadas and Dr. Alberto Serrano Pozo. Uh, and some of the research that I'm sharing with you today are very similar to some of the things that we do uh, in, in the lab to try to solve these intractable problems. So the first question that we should answer really is, why does anyone do research? What is, what is the point of engaging in research and what is the, what is the motivation? Scientific research can allow us to solve intractable global problems and thereby create impactful change in our communities. The problem that I'm interested in is Alzheimer's disease. So here's an example of the impact of scientific research. Currently, 5.8 million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's disease at an estimated cost of $244 billion annually to our economy, and that's just to the U.S. economy. If nothing is done, if research fails, if we fail to, prov to provide a, a disease-modifying treatment or therapy for our patients, by 2050, we anticipate that we'll have 13.8 million patients with Alzheimer's. And of course, uh, these fiscal numbers, these statistics, fail to account for the em emotional burden that's imposed on families, patients, and caregivers uh, who suffer from Alzheimer's disease. So here's one example of a disorder that researchers endeavor to try and solve. The next question that's directly applicable to you, the listener, is how can you be a researcher? As a high school or a college student, what's the best way to be involved in research at any level? And I would say the first answer is designing a rigorous course of studies. You have to be very careful picking the courses uh, that you are taking to ensure that you're establishing a fundamental base of knowledge, which you can then apply to research. These are things like advanced biology courses. Coding courses for dry lab, for bioinformatics work are very, very critical. Uh, once you do that, once you've taken the prerequisite courses to give yourself enough knowledge to get a 4A into research, then you have two options available to you. You can either do dry lab research, which is research that is done on a computer, computational or mathematical modeling, and we'll talk about the differences uh, in, in a future slide. And if you want to do dry lab research, of course, you have to learn how to code. So useful languages to begin with are Java for a general overview of object-oriented programming, R and Python. R and Python are very critical data science languages. Most researchers are either using R or Python unless you're doing some specialized work. So if I had to recommend a language to learn, I would say start with R and then learn Python. Both are very simple to pick up and they are um, a wealth of resources available online 
I, uh, I like the edX courses that are available if you want something structured. I'm also a big proponent of learning by doing. So don't be afraid to just jump right in, follow the online blog posts, something like Medium towards data science and follow their instructions and you'll pick up the language easily. Next is identify a problem that you're passionate about. When I was looking for a problem, it came naturally to me. I was a caretaker for my grandma, so looking at her condition, I identified that Alzheimer's is what I want to spend my time researching on. Of course, your life may be impacted by different problems, or perhaps someone you know, someone in your community may be struggling with one of these conditions. Hence, identify a problem that you're passionate about and apply your skills to tackle it. And finally, reach out to mentors with expertise in your field who can guide you and guide your development uh, as a scientist as you learn to engage in, uh, in coding and in research. If you're interested in a wet lab research, that is hands-on pipetting experiments, reach out to scientists and researchers at your local university who are in your field of interest. Go on the website and look them up. Some tips when you're reaching out to researchers. Researchers are really busy, so make sure to make your email concise, and don't be afraid to email multiple of them. It might be challenging to get a response. When you're reaching out, be sure to include a cover letter and a resume, and be specific. Why does their research excite you? L take a, m a moment and look at the papers that the group is publishing, and examine their research, and be sure that when you apply to a research group, you really wanna work with them. Now briefly, I'll give an overview of what does it mean to do wet lab versus dry lab research? What are the advantages and disadvantages of each? Of course, you don't have to choose both. And in fact, the modern scientist is well equipped to have both wet lab and dry lab experience. If you choose to do wet lab work, that means that you're going to be doing physical experiments. It might be challenging to access for high school students, maybe less so for college students, but you will acquire a very useful skill set. At the same time, when you're working at the introductory level, possible experiments may be limited in scope. When you're looking at dry lab research, you're, co you're conducting computational or mathematical analysis. So like I mentioned earlier, it is indispensable to have a knowledge of how to code and, and perhaps knowledge of statistics as well. These are things that you can learn as you are doing the research. It's accessible to anyone with a computer and internet access. However, coding knowledge is important. In, uh, in contrast to wet lab research, in dry lab, you can readily perform analyses across massive cohorts of patients, which is something that makes me very excited about dry lab research, about computational research, because you know that you can analyze massive groups of patients. And with the rise of big data and more patient data is being made available publicly, this is a very exciting prospect for dry lab research. But it's important to remember that computational conclusions should usually be validated experimentally uh, before being applied to patient research. So that was our introduction on how to get involved in student research. Next, let's dive into a background, starting with genes, DNA, and RNA. Uh, Ayush, there was one question if you want to look at the Q&A. Oh, sure, let's see. Why not go to R and Python directly? Is Java easier to learn? Exactly. Um, Java is, I think, important because most, uh, or a good majority of high school and college level classes are taught in Java. I started with Java and it was useful to get uh, a feel for the syntax. What does it mean to have, a, to define a function um, and to, to have an object in, in coding? That's why I think Java is, is important. However, of course, um, if you are already familiar with coding, then I would definitely recommend starting with R and Python uh, because those are very powerful languages that have direct applicability to what you're doing. Okay, so let's dive into the background, the biology background. Starting with the fundamentals, what are genes? So as you probably know, DNA, otherwise called uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, is the building block of life and the genetic material of all organisms on Earth. It contains the information that the cell requires to synthesize protein and to replicate itself. To be short, it's the storage repository for the information that is required for any cell to function. And uh, the famous double helix structure of DNA was discovered in 1953. There are four nucleotide bases, which are the alphabet of DNA, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine. And DNA is double-stranded where each base pair has a complementary base. I hope that this is all review for you if you've taken an introductory biology course. And if all the DNA bases of a human genome were typed as A, C, T, and G, the three billion letters would fill 4,000 books of 500 pages each. So that's a fun fact about DNA. Human DNA is wound into chromosomes, 
we have 23 pairs of chromosomes and each chromosome is further divided into functional units called genes. The Human Genome Project estimates that we have about 20,000 to 25,000 protein coding genes. Each gene provides instructions for a functional product that is a molecule needed to perform a job in the cell. In many cases, the functional product of a gene is a protein. But sometimes, a gene may also produce a functional RNA molecule. This is called a non-coding gene. Different copies of the same gene are called alleles, and they account for human variation. So of course, the important part here is that genes code for proteins. This idea is called the central dogma of biology. And, and we're going to go through a quick review of transcription and translation. Transcription is the process of making an RNA copy of a gene sequence. So this copy, which is called a messenger RNA molecule, leaves the nucleus of the cell and enters the cytoplasm, where it directs the synthesis of the protein which it encodes. Translation is the process of translating that messenger RNA, that mRNA sequence, uh, to a sequence of amino acids during protein synthesis. And so the genetic code is, think about it as the blueprint of your proteins. The genetic code describes the relationship between the sequence of base pairs in a gene and the corresponding amino acid sequence that it encodes. In the cell cytoplasm, the ribosome reads the uh, sequence of mRNA in groups of three bases called codons to assemble the protein. So this, again, is called the central dogma of biology, and it's really important to understand transcription and translation as we move into uh, talking about transcriptomics. Finally, another key concept to remember from our biology classes is that diseases are multifactorial. So most genes that we get from our parents are copies of the ones that uh, and work in the same way as they do in our parents, but sometimes a gene is not a perfect copy. So changes in genes are called mutations, and everyone has mutations. Some mutations work better than the original, some make no difference at all, but some mutations cause problems. So a genetic disease is a disease that's caused by an abnormality in the genetic makeup of an individual. That genetic abnormality can range from minuscule to major, from a single mutation in a single base pair of, in the DNA of a single gene to a gross chromosomal abnormality. Think of a deletion uh, or a subtraction or an addition of many, many, many base pairs. Multifactorial inheritance is also called complex or polygenic inheritance. And our, the most common disorders which have the greatest impact to human health are almost always multifactorial. They're caused by a combination of environmental factors and mutations in multiple genes. For example, different genes that in, uh, influence breast cancer susceptibility have been found on chromosomes 6, 11, 13, 14, 15, 17, and 22. So here's just one example that any given disease that you're looking at uh, may be a, a wide variety of genes, as well as environmental factors, may underlie that disease. And some common chronic dis diseases are also multifactorial disorders. So really, we are interested in studying multifactorial disorders and understanding what is the basket of genes that contribute to the uh, pathogenesis of the disease that we're interested in. So to do that, we look at the transcriptome. The transcriptome is the set of all RNA molecules in one cell or a population of cells. This includes the protein coding, so the mRNA, but also non-coding RNA. That's ribosomal RNA, tRNA or transfer RNA, long non-coding RNA, pre-microRNA, uh, and other types of non-coding RNAs. So the transcriptome may apply to an entire organism or a specific cell type. We're interested in the transcriptome because as it's the set of all the RNA molecules that are being expressed, it's a dynamic and good representation of the cellular state. And we can use it to uh, study the gene expression levels of, our, of a wide variety of genes. So generally, the goal of transcriptome analysis is to identify genes that are differentially expressed among different conditions, leading to a new understanding of the genes or pathways associated with the conditions. So there's one thing I want you to take away from this section, it's this that the goal of, I'm gonna repeat that sentence, the goal of transcriptome analysis is to identify genes that are differentially expressed. So if you're looking at a healthy person and if you're looking at a person who has the disease that you're interested in, you want to identify genes that have a higher expression level or a lower expression level than the healthy person. And of course, you're doing this across multiple patients. So you wanna identify genes whose difference is statistically significant. Transcriptome analysis requires an appropriate statistical method with a multiple comparison test to interpret global changes in the expression of thousands of genes. Does anyone have any questions about this key idea? 
what do you mean by, by expression? Do you, okay. The expression level of a gene. So you know that uh, we discussed earlier how each gene is transcribed and then translated. The rate at which the gene is transcribed is called its expression level. So the number of copies that any given cell is producing of a, of a specific gene, that's the gene's expression level. So when I mean differentially expressed, let's say we're talking about gene X and we have a healthy patient and a diseased patient. In any specific cell, the healthy patient might have five copies of gene X. And if gene X is involved in the disease, then you might see no copies of gene X in the disease patient, or you might see 10, 20 copies of gene X in the disease patient. If you see more copies, that gene is upregulated in disease. If you see less copies, that gene is downregulated in disease. But let's say we have gene Y. If gene Y isn't involved in the disease, then we would expect gene Y to have the same level in both the healthy and the diseased patient. Hence, we want to identify genes which are differentially expressed or have different expression levels in healthy and diseased patients. Does that make sense? Let's move on to section three, transcriptomics. So here we're going to cover two techniques to generate uh, tra uh, transcript expression data. One of them is uh, microarray, DNA microarrays, and the other one is RNA-seq. Let's dive right in. Okay, so like I said, you can generate data on RNA transcripts via two main techniques or two main principles. You can sequence individual transcripts, uh, that those are, uh, that's the RNA-seq approach, or you can hybridize transcript to an ordered array of nucleotide probes. What does that mean? Let's, uh, let's examine. So all transcriptomic methods require RNA to first be isolated from the experimental organism before we can measure their expression levels. So remember, we're trying to isolate the transcriptome of uh, a specific cell line in a patient that we're interested in. So although biological systems are really diverse, RNA extraction techniques are broadly similar and they involve a couple of key steps. First, mechanical disruption of cells or tissues. So let's say um, if I'm studying Alzheimer's, for example, I'm going to get a brain sample from a patient. I'm going to take this brain sample and homogenize the tissue in a phenol containing solution. And I'm going to disrupt RNAase with what are called chaotropic salts, disrupt the macromolecules and the nucleotide complexes. So what does this mean? RNA, remember, is packaged inside our cells. We want to disrupt our cells, we want to lyse our cells, so the RNA is made available to us. So now, and as you can see here in the diagram on the side, these are different Eppendorf tubes. So this is exactly how one of these approaches might, uh, might be performed, where you take the brain sample and you dissociate it in an Eppendorf tube via centrifugation, and then you lyse the cells to make the RNA available. Step two, then you want to separate just the RNA from all the undesired biomolecules. So that includes DNA, that includes proteins, that includes lipids, and so on and so forth. So, to do that, we use an elution membrane. So nucleic acids are bound to this membrane by passing the lysate. So the lysate is the homogenized cell solution that's lysed. We pass that lysate through the membrane using centrifugal force. So we apply a centrifuge. And then we apply wash solutions to wash out all the other uh, undesired biomolecules, but the membrane that we're washing through is specifically uh, designed to bind nucleic acids. So I'll repeat that statement again. We take the cell lysate, uh, and I realize you can't see my mouse, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can use a laser pointer. There we go. So we take the cell lysate here, and we apply it to what's called this elution column. This column has a filter right here, which is designed to trap the RNA. As, and you can see that in the next step here. So this is the, our RNA sequences, which are trapped here, and we apply washing solutions to the top, to wash out all the other undesired biomolecules, proteins, lipids, et cetera. Finally, we concentrate the RNA after we discard all the other undesired biomolecules, we concentrate the RNA by applying an elution solution, an alcohol-based elution solution, uh, and the sample is then collected into the tube by centrifugation. So for those of you, by the way, a quick side note, who are unaware of what centrifugation is, centrifugation is basically an approach uh, to spin samples at high speed and you use the centrifugal force uh, to separate the, the, your different classes of molecules based on density. Isolated RNA may then additionally be treated with DNAase 
to digest any traces of DNA. It is often necessary to enrich messenger RNA or mRNA, as total RNA extracts are typically 98% ribosomal RNA. So enrichment for transcript can be performed by poly-A affinity methods. So if you remember um, in eukaryotes, we have uh, mRNA processing. One of those steps is the addition of a poly-A tail. So poly-A affinity methods add a tag to uh, the poly-A sequence, which allows you to separate out your mRNA. You can also deplete ribosomal RNA using sequence-specific probes. Let's see. Is it correct to assume that RNA will be present in some cells that are undergoing transcription? Yes. Remember, all of our cells are generally undergoing transcription at, at any point in time uh, because they need, they need to undergo trans transcription to produce the proteins which are responsible for cellular function. And how is DNA removed? DNA is removed by treating it with a DNA ACE. That's an enzyme that degrades DNA to digest any traces of DNA. So now, by the end of this step, we should have our sample here, which is pure RNA, the RNA sample which we're interested in. Once we've extracted our RNA, we want to convert it into a complementary DNA or cDNA library. This is generally because cDNA or DNA is more stable, is amplifiable, and all of our sequence analysis techniques are dependent on DNA. They use DNA as the input, not RNA. So before constructing our library, and I, I talked about this briefly on the previous slide, one must choose an appropriate library preparation protocol, which will enrich or deplete a total RNA sample for a particular RNA species. So the total RNA pool, remember from uh, the background uh, section, includes ribosomal RNA or rRNA, precursor messenger RNA or pre-mRNA, mRNA, and our non-coding RNA. Uh, in most cell types, the majority of RNA molecules are ribosomal RNA, and if the rRNA transcripts are not removed, they will consume the bulk of the sequencing reads. So uh, that's why we apply the poly-A uh, affinity approach to separate out the mRNA. This means, by the way, that it, we can assume from this point forward that we're only considering our coding sequences. So we're not considering our non-coding RNA. And of course, there are approaches to analyze non-coding RNA using microarrays, using RNA-seq. But for right now, let's assume that we're only, uh, we're only considering our coding sequences. And our coding sequences are those that code directly for protein. And, and I see there's a question on the chat. How do you specifically get mRNA? So I'll answer that one more time. If you remember back from biology, when you have your mRNA sequence, your mRNA sequence is processed before um, being translated. One of those processing steps adds a poly-A tail to your mRNA. So uh, the, the poly-A tail distinguishes mRNA from transfer RNA and rRNA, and can therefore be used as a primer site for reverse transcription. So we're using the poly-A tail uh, that's attached to the end of our mRNA sequences to distinguish between our mRNA and our tRNA or our rRNA. So once our mRNA is purified, um, you add a primer which binds to the poly-A tail, and that provides a free three prime end. This three prime end is extended by an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. You may have heard of reverse transcriptase because it's often used in viruses. Uh, reverse transcriptase creates a complementary DNA strand. So if you remember, our RNA is single-stranded, DNA is double-stranded. And if you uh, think back to biology, every base pair has a complementary base. So what reverse transcriptase does is it matches the base pairs of our RNA sequence to their complementary DNA sequence, thereby converting our RNA to our DNA. Then the mRNA is removed using an RNA enzyme, leaving a single-stranded cDNA. That's called, uh, the abbreviation is SSC DNA. This single-stranded DNA is then converted into a double-stranded DNA molecule with the help of DNA polymerase. However, um, for DNA polymerase to do this, it needs another free three prime end. This is provided by the generation of a hairpin loop at the end of the single-stranded DNA molecule. What do we do after we have our cDNA library? So now we've converted our RNA, uh, our RNA extraction, and we purified the RNA, and now we're converting it to a cDNA library. Once you finish converting it to a cDNA library, a popular 
uh, approach is to amplify the cDNA. And remember, this is possible because cDNA can be cloned into bacterial plasmids and then amplified in bacteria, but you can't do this with RNA. So this is another reason why having a cDNA library is really important. So now that we've finished our library preparation step, we can move on to actual analysis of our cDNA library. We're first going to talk about microarrays. So microarrays consist of sh short nucleotide oligomers, so short sequences known as probes. These probes are arranged in a grid on the glass slide, and these are pretty small. Uh, they're about the size of a matchstick. So the core principle behind microarrays is hybridization between two DNA strands. Again, if you think back to your biology class, the property of a complementary nucleic acid sequence uh, is that it will specifically pair with each other. So if you have two nucle nucleic acid sequences, which are complementary to each other, they'll pair with each other by forming hydrogen bonds between the complementary nu uh, nucleotide base pairs. A high number of complementary base pairs in a nucleotide sequence means tighter non-convalent bonding between the two strands. So when you have your uh, microarray chip, your gene chip, with a bunch of probes on it, you apply your cDNA sample to the microarray chip. The, and this chip uh, can consist of tens of thousands of these original uh, oligomers of these probes. These probes are the genes that you're investigating. This is really important. So these chips are designed to investigate specific sets of genes, uh, you know, 10,000, 20,000, up to 40,000 genes at a time. All the other genes that you've extracted from your mRNA, we're not going to consider those genes. We're only going to consider the genes that this chip is designed to consider. That's an important thing to remember. Uh, and let me just check the Q&A one more time. So how long are the cDNA strands? Um, I mean, mRNA strands can be a variable length. I don't have a good length for you. Uh, I know that in in some approaches that they've been limited to 100 base pairs in length, but mRNA strands can be a very variable length. Uh, let's see, the, so we've covered microarrays. You have a good understanding now that a microarray is a gene chip with all of these individual probes that are, and when you apply your cDNA sample, they're hybridizing to your microarray chip. One thing that's important uh, to note is before you apply your cDNA sample, you actually tag it with a fluorescent reporter. So when your when your uh, cDNA probe hybridizes to uh, when you, when your cDNA library hybridizes to your microarray probe, it glows uh, because of your fluorescent reporter that you uh, labeled your transcripts with. Therefore, this is really critical. You can measure the fluorescence intensity at each probe location on the array, and that should be correlated with the transcript abundance for that probe sequence. I'll repeat that sentence one more time. It's critical. The fluorescence intensity at each probe location on the array indicates the transcript abundance for that probe sequence. And that's because, let's say I have gene X. Let's go back to gene X. In my cDNA library, let's say gene X is being expressed at a very high rate. So I have, and I'm speaking in relative units here, I have 100 copies of gene X in my cDNA library. But gene Y is expressed at a low rate, so I only have five copies of gene Y. When I apply my cDNA library to my microarray chip, more copies of gene X will bind to the oligomer probes on the microarray chip. Therefore, the gene X probe will glow brighter than the probe for gene Y. Sometimes control and disease samples are analyzed together. Then they're labeled with different reporters. Uh, oftentimes your control sample is labeled with a green reporter and your disease sample is labeled with a red reporter. And that in, in this diagram at the side right here, you can see that pretty clearly where the green samples have high expression in, in the healthy patient, the red, uh, the red genes over here have high expression in the disease patient. Uh, but for, for the uh, studies that we're going to consider, all of these patients have had, uh, we perform these steps individually for all of our patients. So for both healthy and disease patients, we're using the same microarray chips to measure the abundance of our transcript levels uh, across a cassette of 10,000, 20,000, 40,000 genes. I'll discuss briefly some issues with microarrays, some things that we have to keep in mind uh, 
and some other alternative approaches, uh, including RNA sequencing. So some issues with microarrays include cross-hybridization artifacts, poor quantification of lowly and highly expressed genes. So if you have too little or too much of your gene, you won't get a good readout, and you need to know the sequence a priori. And this is, this is pretty critical. Um, when, when you're thinking about the way a microarray a gene chip is designed, remember that I said that it's designed to target a specific cassette of genes. Uh, uh, and that means that if you have a gene that's not in your cassette, that's not in on your gene chip, you won't measure its expression level. Uh, now that's why luckily gene chips are pretty broad. So we're measuring all the genes that usually people think are relevant. But of course, it's, it would be a much better approach to measure all of the genes in the genome um, that are being expressed. So a history of transcriptomics. The word transcriptome was first used in the 1990s. And in 1995, uh, one of the earliest sequencing-based transcriptomic methods was developed. So in contrast to hybridization-based methods, where you're applying your DNA sample and measuring the hybridization level, sequence-based approaches have been developed to elucidate the transcriptome by directly determining the transcript sequence. Uh, so initially, the generation of expressed sequence tags, or EST libraries, by Sanger sequencing of cDNA was used in gene expression studies. But this approach uh, is relatively low throughput. It's very intensive, very hard to do, and very expensive. So it's not ideal for quantifying transcripts. Uh, this was pioneered around 1995. And uh, to overcome these constraints, tag-based methods, such as serial analysis, of, uh, serial analysis of gene expression, or SAGE, and cap analysis of gene expression, or CAGE, were developed to enable higher throughput and more precise quantification of, of expression levels. Uh, but again, these approaches are insensitive to measuring expression levels of splice isoforms. So for those of you who've taken advanced biology, you know that genes can be alternatively spliced and SAGE and CAGE are not very effective at measuring uh, alternatively spliced isoforms. And again, they're expensive. So they also require large amounts of input RNA. So I'm gonna mention these approaches briefly, but we're not really gonna discuss them. Um, what we are going to discuss though, are RNA sequencing. So RNA sequencing is a next generation sequencing technology that's similar in principle to DNA microarrays, but you don't need a priori knowledge of your genes. So instead of hybridizing a library to a gene chip, we use what's called a sequencer to measure the transcript expression levels. And you can do this with single cell re resolution. So you can actually measure, measure your transcript home individually for different cells. That's called single cell RNA-seq. So early methods separated individual cells into separate wells. More recent methods, you encapsulate individual cells in droplets in a microfluidic device. Uh, and then you perform all of our previous steps. So converting, uh, you're purifying the RNA and you're converting your RNA to cDNA. You're, pr you're performing all of those steps in your microfluidic device. And then you're actually digesting them into fragments of appropriate size. You're uh, digesting them by introns. Uh, and you're fragmenting your RNA prior to reverse transcription and cDNA synthesis. So each droplet here carries a DNA barcode that uniquely labels your cDNA is derived from a single cell. W once reverse transcription is complete, the cDNAs from all of your cells are mixed together for sequencing. So you're actually using these, sequencing, these sequencers, um, these commercial sequencers, to read the nucleotide sequence of, um, of your cDNA library. And transcripts from a particular cell are identified by the unique barcode, which we tag them with. Now, how, may you ask, do you measure the abundance? Uh, and that's basically by the number of reads that you have for any given uh, sequence that you're looking at, in, at once you get your sequencing data back. And we'll talk very briefly uh, in the next section about how to analyze RNA-seq data. But I wanted to put that out there that microarray data uh, micro sets are becoming old and RNA-seq is an increasingly popular approach for analyzing uh, transcriptomics data. So if you're interested in, in pursuing this field, you should start with microarray data, but don't be afraid to take a look at RNA-seq data as well, because uh, that's a pretty indispensable tool for a transcriptomics researcher to have, is to analyze RNA-seq data. So I can take questions. I know that was a lot of information, so I can take questions right now. If not, we can move on to the next section. Oh, sure. Can I go into the limitations of DNA microarrays again? Let me go back one slide. So I think the biggest limitation that I that I um, is important to remember is that DNA microarrays are based off of predefined cassettes. So you need to know the sequence a priori uh, versus a sequencing based approach 
you can uh, measure the sequence of transcripts that you don't, you, you haven't identified them as genes beforehand. But when you're using uh, DNA microarrays, remember you have to use your predefined gene chip. The gene chip has a series of oligomers, a series of probes. Um, and those probes are what you're going to be measuring. If you have a gene that isn't represented by one of those probes, you're not going to measure the expression level of that gene. Now, so that's one important thing to remember. And sequencing approaches are generally more exact. So you have better quantification of your, um, of your reads, of your transcripts, especially when you have very low and very highly expressed genes. And finally, another thing that I didn't mention before is that microarrays are often uh, uh, suspect because they're subject to user specific effects or batch effects. So in between different experiments, you have to perform a variety of different steps to control for the differences between microarrays because in one from one, one microarray to a next, you might have variable results. You have to normalize them. And well, how about the cost difference between microarray and RNA sequencing? That's right. So RNA sequencing is becoming increasingly cheaper. Um, uh, microarrays are, I believe, cheaper than RNA sequencing. And uh, the reason that I started using microarrays is because a lot of that data is publicly available. Um, so there's a, a wealth of microarray data that's already out there. And the analysis is more straightforward than RNA sequencing. Um, but yes, there is, there is a cost difference. That cost difference is, is shortening. Let's see. Okay, so our, our next section is focused on a hands-on live demo of how can you perform a, an analysis experiment on microarray data. So now that we've generated our data, we need to analyze it. I'm gonna repeat a statement that I said earlier in the previous section because this is really important. If there's one thing you should take away from this talk, it's this. We would like to search for differentially expressed genes. So we performed all of our previous steps, purifying the RNA, generating our cDNA library, and hybridizing to our microarray gene chip. We performed them for healthy patients and for diseased patients. We now want to search for differentially expressed genes, which show statistically significant differences in expression levels between healthy and diseased patients. So this is called differential expression analysis. And I'm going to walk you through a differential expression analysis of a single Alzheimer's data set right now. The reason that I asked you to come prepared uh, with five diseases which you're interested in is because you can do this analysis at home. So if you have your computer up and if you would like to, feel free to follow along. And I'm going to put this link, uh, let's see, in the chat. Um, I'm going to put this link in the chat right now ncbi.nlm.nih.gov backslash geo. So that's our gene expression omnibus, which is a repository of microarray data. It's really quite useful. The reason that I encourage you to do this is because this analysis, there are some uh, really convenient previously developed web-based tools that you can use to perform differential expression analysis. You can do this at home, and this can be your first introduction to bioinformatics work. So if you would like to follow along, feel free to follow along right now. Uh, and I will do this analysis on an Alzheimer's data set, but you can do this on a data set that you're interested in. So pick one of your five diseases that you're passionate about. Try to pick one that is more common because you're likely to get better results. You won't have to spend as much time searching for a data set that works. Um, but you feel free to follow along right now, or this webinar will be recorded. So you can go back and follow along afterwards as well. So let's jump right into the live demo. This is the Gene Expression Omnibus webpage. Uh, when you go to the link that I put in the chat, you will come up with this webpage. In the search bar right here, I want you to type your disease of interest. So in my case, I typed Alzheimer's. When you do that, this box will appear. You should pick, select your geo datasets. So you wanna click on this link right here. So here, as you can see, there's 4,333 results. Obviously, that's much too many results. So we want to filter our data. So when I, when I search for the Alzheimer's data sets, this is the page that I'm going to get. And if you, if you do the same search, you will get the same page. Notice that I've applied some filters at the side. So let's take a closer look at some of these filters. So I filtered for uh, geo series. So we want to consider geo series, not data set samples or platforms. I've applied an organism filter. So 
when you're looking, uh, when, when you open up this page by yourself, you won't see this organism filter. So you have to hit this customize button and search for homo sapiens. When you search for homo sapiens, it'll limit your data sets to just those that are in humans. Now, of course, you can also do this analysis on, for example, mice, mus musculans. But for our purposes, I, to me, it's more interesting to do analysis on human data rather than mouse data. And finally, you want to look for expression profiling by array. So click these three, uh, these three restrictions, these three filters at the side right here to limit your data. Next, you want to, and I'll, I'll zoom back out right here. This page, if you scroll down, these are going to be your individual data sets. Pick one that looks interesting to you. Here's the one that I picked. So I picked transcriptomic analysis of probable asymptomatic and symptomatic Alzheimer brains. This is sixth in the list. So if you do these exact same steps and you follow along you'll, and you scroll down, you will find this data set, um, sixth in the list. You can also use this accession number right here, GSE 118553, to look up this data set um, from this page. So if you type in the accession number that begins with GSE, you can look up your data set. This is a paper, um, it's, a, it's a recent paper uh, from which this study, this data set, this GEO data set is derived from. So this is a paper, uh, they looked at, they performed a transcriptomic analysis on 27 control patients, 33 patients with asymptomatic Alzheimer's. So these are Alzheimer's patients who don't so, show symptoms, but they do show neuropathology. And we, are, we call those asymptomatic Alzheimer's patients. So they're likely to develop Alzheimer's um, and they have high vulnerability to Alzheimer's, but their cognition is intact. And then they performed it on 52 patients who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, who are currently suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And they took these, uh, they performed the analysis on uh, samples from the entorhinal cortex, frontal cortex, temporal cortex, and cerebellum. What does this mean? So this means that they took, uh, this is, uh, analysis is obviously done post-mortem. So they're taking the brains of these patients and they're sectioning off, they're taking individual samples from each of these brain regions for all of these patients. So obviously you're gonna have something like 400 uh, different, different microarray runs, different microarray readouts uh, in this data set. I hope that makes sense. That's you know, 27 plus 33 plus 52. So that's our number of patients times the four individual brain regions that they performed their analysis over. Uh, and we, for our purposes, I'm gonna say, let's exclude the asymptomatic Alzheimer's patients because our analysis is going to be more simple and more straightforward. So let's only look at the control patients and the Alzheimer's patients. And let's specifically look at the frontal cortex. Let's not examine the entorhinal cortex, temporal cortex, and cerebellum tissue. And I'll go back to a question that was uh, asked earlier, which was what are the, some of the limitations of microarray studies? Now, one of those limitations are batch effects. So the more that we can keep our samples homogenous uh, from the same brain regions, from the same data set, the better and the cleaner our results are going to be. So if there are no questions about this, about this paper, and of course, if you're interested, here's the paper. This will be on, on the webinar that's recorded online. You can go and check this out later. Um, I, we can move on to the actual analysis. So if I go back, I want to click this link right here. I've uh, made it purple, but I want to click this link, and it will take me to this page. This page is the uh, series entry for this data set. Now, as you can see, there's the title of the data set right here, Transmitomic Analysis of Probable Asymptomatic and Symptomatic Alzheimer's Brains. Here's our, uh, the summary of the abstract of the paper. Uh, 27 control, 30, 33 asymptomatic Alzheimer's and 52 Alzheimer's subjects. Great. If you scroll down, if you scroll down, this will be a long web page. So if you scroll down, you'll see this button here, analyze the GO2R. The GO2R is a very convenient web tool that's available on the Gene Expression Omnibus web page to perform basic differential expression analysis. Now I like GO2R because it's very easy to classify your samples. There's a nice interface to do this. So I recommend that if you're starting off um, with differential expression analysis, do this in GO2R. And of course, I'll show you the source code um, so you can put, uh, tweak and toggle this analysis yourself if you want to get more advanced. And we were right, there are 401 samples in this data set. And as you can see, let's just uh, look at the naming convention for one sample, temporal cortex Alzheimer's. 
So the patient who had Alzheimer's, and this is a sample from the temporal cortex, and they ran this on one microarray chip. Okay, so when you click on Analyzed with GO2R, you'll get a page that looks similar to this. Note that these two groups won't be here. You'll have to define them yourself. So remember, we have to tell GO2R which samples are from our diseased patients and which samples are from our healthy patients. It doesn't inherently know. We have to define it ourselves. Now remember that I wanted to restrict the analysis to just control patients and just Alzheimer's patients. So I have in this a long list of 401 samples, I've gone through and selected the samples that are frontal cortex, Alzheimer's, and frontal cortex control. You can't see the control here because it's the page wasn't large enough, um, but there were 23 control samples and 40 Alzheimer's samples. So I just scrolled down here and I selected each of the samples that are Alzheimer's and each that are control. And a quick tip how to do this, um, at the very top of of the page, you will see a bar here and you can order by sample name. So if you order by sample name, you'll just see groups of samples. So all of your samples that are frontal cortex Alzheimer's will be grouped together. I'll take a couple of questions. Let's see, I see there are a few more. Is there a control group from the same age group? Um, so generally when you're designing, this is back to experimental design. Generally when you're designing your control groups and your uh, disease groups, you want to make sure that they are from the same age group, yes. And that's, that's just basically because you don't want to make sure, that, uh, you want to make sure that there's no sample selection bias. Um, and this is uh, statistics, in, in statistics, one of the, the, perhaps the most common cause of flawed experimental design is when uh, researchers choose their samples poorly. And you know, there's some very classic cases of that. One, one case is, I think it was 1936, um, there was a presidential race and the Literary Digest was trying to predict the presidential race. So they pulled people who had automobiles and uh, people who had automobiles and people who had telephones. And they predicted that candidate A was gonna win the, win the race. They were grievously wrong because it turns out people who had automobiles were the wealthy segment of the population. So that's called a sample selection bias. And whenever you're designing your experiment, you wanna make sure that your control group and your disease group or, or your experimental group are as similar as possible. Um, now, that's not something generally that we have to worry about because we can hope that the experimenters who uploaded this data, who've done the physical experimentation, so all of these, these, these researchers have already prepared, uh, extracted the RNA, done the cDNA library, picked the patients, so on and so forth. We can hope that they've done that already. Uh, the next question is, what should we press so we can get to that page, the accession display page? Let me see, let me go back. Um, the accession display page, I assume you're talking about this page right here, yes. If you wanna get to this page, when you, when you click on the search, you click on this link right here, this top link for the data set that you're interested in. So if you zoom in, it's this link at the top right here. And I'll take you straight to the accession display page. So here we've defined our control group and we've defined our disease group. This is really useful. Um, so now that we have these two groups defined, we can go ahead with, with our analysis. Um, and like I mentioned before, we restrict our analysis to frontal cortex control versus Alzheimer's cases. Now, if you scroll down on this page, you'll see a box with some headings. One of the headings will be value distribution. So if you click on value distribution, and I'm not gonna do this live because it takes some time to run. So I've run this previously and I've got the results saved on the next slide for you. If you click on value distribution, you'll get a plot like this. This is a box plot. Now what does this plot tell, tell us? This plot tells us that if you're looking at our control and our disease samples, um, the relative distribution of their gene expression levels is pretty similar. It's, it, it would be a problem, for example, if you had, um, if, if, the, the median, if, the, if the median expression level was less for all of the control samples and greater for all of the AD samples, or less for a subset of the, of the control samples or the AD samples or vice versa. 
this would be a problem because our, that means that something's gone wrong in the experiment. There's some serious outliers in the data, and that's going to skew our results. We're going to see more genes that are downregulated than upregulated, and I'll talk about this in a minute. So when you do this, when you generate this graph, you pretty much want to see there's a pretty even distribution of all of your samples um, across your data set that you're interested in. Next, you'll see, um, you'll see a little tab at the bottom over here called Geo2R Analysis. And then you can click Top 250 and then Save All Results. When you click Top 250 and Save All Results, you'll get, again, this is, so this is the value distribution tab. You should click on the Geo2R tab. There'll be a button here that says Top 250. Um, and you'll get a page that looks something like this. These are our results, folks. These are, these are what we're really interested in. And I'll walk you through what each column here means. So our p-value is our significance test. Um, now, one important thing uh, that you shouldn't get confused by is that this is not the, the change. This is not the size of the change. There's a big difference between significance test and between effect size. Our effect size is the log of the fold change. So this is the, um, the log of the expression change between the uh, healthy person and the diseased person. And if it's negative, that means that in the diseased person, the value of this specific gene, so each row here represents the gene that we're interested in. If it's negative, that means the value of this specific gene was less than in the healthy person. If it's positive, that means the value was greater than in the healthy person. So this is our effect size. Uh, if the greater this is, the bigger the difference is between our uh, healthy and our diseased person. However, this is a really key point. This isn't how confident we are in our results. And a, a good way to explain this is, let's say I'm trying to make a measurement in the real world. Um, and I'm trying to measure how big uh, Mount Everest is. Or, or the, the difference between Mount Everest versus my house. Obviously a massive difference. So my, the log of my fold change is going to be really, really huge. But if I measure with my glasses off, or if I'm standing from a far distance and I don't have a good ruler, maybe I'm not so confident in that difference. Let's say I'm looking at it from a distance of several hundred, several thousand miles. I can't really judge the difference accurately between a, two small dots on the horizon. So even though the difference perceived may be large, I'm not able to judge that accurately. On the other hand, if I'm using a very precise measurement, let's say I'm using um, a laser-based uh, a, a laser measurement to calculate the difference in altitudes between these two points, then I can have a very precise measurement. But I could also get a precise measurement if I'm measuring the difference between, uh, let's say, mountain Everest and a neighboring mountain. So that's just a brief example to try to explain to you the difference between effect size and significance. Significance is different from effect size. Effect size is the size of the difference that you're observing. Significance is how confident you are in that observation. That's a really important fact. Now note that we're going to use the adjusted p-value because um, this is something called the Bonfroni correction has been applied to, uh, to these values to adjust for multiple comparison. Remember way back when uh, in the original slide, I mentioned that you need to apply a test um, to, uh, to adjust for multiple comparisons, this is a statistical test. So this, as you can see, um, reduces the rate of false positives in our data. So this is our adjusted p-value. This is how confident we are in our data. Usually you want your adjusted p-value to be less than 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. Um, that's, that, that gives you good confidence in, in, in your results. And this is our log odds of differential expression, and this is the, our effect size. So the, again, the greater this is, the bigger the change between normal and disease is going to be. Here we have our gene symbols. These are all the genes that we're interested in. Uh, and this is, these are their full gene names. So I pulled some out for us um, so you can just see when, uh, in, in bigger font what our results might look like for a typical differential expression analysis. Now this year, I'm, I'm going to show you briefly, this is a source code that you can use uh, to perform uh, differential expression analysis. This is generated by Geo2R. It's, it's, it's very useful. Um, one of the things that uh, I'll mention to those who are 
coding savvy is that we apply a log to transform to normalize our data. Uh, and then this e-based technique is our, is our differential expression test right here. Um, and this, this chunk of code right here produces the box plot, which you saw on the previous page. If you're interested about this, there's some really fantastic tutorials online uh, to figure out what, how this code is doing, what it's doing, and how you can customize it to, to perform your own analyses. Let's say you wanted to perform more nuanced analysis or a different analysis than what Geo2R prescribes. You can get this source code if you, if you go back um, our script. If you click on this tab right here, you'll get your source code and you can use this source code um, to customize it to your own needs. It's a great starting point. Or of course, you could also, uh, the package for this is a Lima. So if you're interested, if you're savvy in R, you want to look at the Lima package and um, write your own code, by all means, go ahead. It's a, it's a really fun thing to do. I wanted to do, uh, do a quick case study to show you the power of our analysis today. Uh, so this is one of the genes that I pulled out from our data set. From this data right over here, I pulled out one of our genes. Uh, that gene is CD74. I pulled it out just because it looks interesting. Um, as you can see, our adjusted p-value is still quite small, so we're good there. It's 0 0.001. Uh, and our log of the fold change is 0.783. So remember, this means that in our disease patient, they have more CD74 than in the healthy patient. I said, interesting. Let's see if there's evidence already in published literature suggest that that might be the case. And you can see this is the structure of CD74 down here. Um, and I found this great paper from molecular regeneration, which suggests that CD74 expression is increased in neurofibrillary tangles. So in Alzheimer's disease, we have uh, pathology is, neuropathology is broadly put, there's two main types of neuropathology. That's beta, uh, beta amyloid plaques and uh, neurofibrillary tangles of the microtubule associated protein tau. So it's quite interesting uh, that CD74 expression is increased in neurofibrillary tangles. And if we look at the abstract down here, it suggests um, they did uh, immunohistochemistry uh, to reveal an increase in CD74 in NFTs, as well as A beta plaques and microglia, which are the support cells for the brain. Um, so one of my projects right now is investigating microglia. This is quite interesting uh, that uh, CD74 has been experimentally validated to be increased in neurofibrillary tangles. So I think this is a, a great job. We have pr produced evidence today, and, and this suggests that something that we're doing is right. Uh, now, one, one key fact, why, did, why is it important to uh, perform something like immunohistochemistry after you've done your differential expression analysis. That's important because really any computational approach is always computational. So we have to remember um, as much as, you know, computational science, it's fascinating, really vastly powerful, uh, very engaging. Uh, we have to also remember that we can't model everything perfectly on the computer. We're always going to have some margin of statistical error and it's, more convincing to develop a body of evidence that includes both computational and computational analysis as well as what's called in vivo or in vitro validation. So you want to go into the lab at some point and a professional scientist would want to go into the lab and validate some of their results um, in a model of disease. Okay, uh, moving forward. Oh, one last thing, actually. Um, this is a key figure from this paper. I thought it was interesting. I thought I'd, uh, I'd like to share this with you. This is a figure from, from this paper. And when I'm talking about experimental validation, this is really what I mean. So this is the Western blot right here for CD74. Um, and you can see the expression level of CD74 is vastly increased in our Alzheimer's uh, samples compared to our control samples. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Western blot, with what a Western blot is, it's just a technique um, to measure the expression level of a specific protein. Uh, and I thought this is a, a really, a really neat figure, which shows a pretty large difference in Alzheimer's versus control. Now, finally, I wanted to uh, mention one last thing on our data analysis uh, uh, unit. 
RNA sequencing technology, uh, when we're doing RNA seq analysis, it's much more involved because you must map E short read. Remember, you're using your sequencer to sequence your entire cDNA library, and then you're mapping each short read to a previously assembled genome reference to get a map of the transcriptome. So I'm not going to go through RNA seq technology. I'm not going to demo it for you here. It's much more involved. Um, but if you're interested, there's some. Again, I encourage you to explore uh, the best resources that I found personally are really tutorials online. Uh, there's some really uh, kind and benevolent data scientists who posted their workflows. You can go through them and figure out how they're doing what they're doing. Um, now, RNA seq uh, analysis is is done much more efficiently in Python. Uh, so, if you're interested, I would I would go down that route. Finally, our last section. Uh, therapeutics and real world case studies. So I'll, I'll give you a brief touch, a brief smattering of what some work in, in transcriptomics might lead to eventually. Transcriptomics analysis are critical first steps for suggesting therapeutic targets for disorders like Alzheimer's, which directly impact patient health. Uh, so here are two case studies. I just um, looked at some very recent case studies of transcriptomics analysis which uh, purport to have therapeutic relevance. Uh, so this is this paper over here is talking about podocytes um, in glomeruli, and they did some transcriptomics analysis to identify signaling pathways which are involved in podocyte pathogenesis. Again, this is like this is completely separate from Alzheimer's. So I, when I'm the point that I'm trying to convey here is that transcriptomics analysis is a technique that you can apply to any disease that you're interested in. It's very widely applicable. Uh, so this is why I hope you're getting excited about what we've talked about today, because you can apply it to a disease of your choice. Pick something that you're interested and passionate about and run full speed with it. Now, this is interesting. I included this paper because they sort of worked backwards. They developed this therapeutic uh, pain of foreign for allergic asthma, but they, were, they, wasn't, they weren't really sure how it was working. How is pain of fluorine working? And um, they used transcriptomics analysis to figure out uh, the pathways which are involved in pain of fluorine. And as you can see down here, they established that pain of fluorine may have a beneficial effect on asthma by regulating fatty acid metabolism, the inflammatory response, and the adhesion pathway. Uh, and something, uh, this is cool for a couple of reasons. Something we didn't talk about today is once you get your differentially expressed genes, you can map to pathways. And pathways are basically, you can think about them as bags of genes, collections of genes which are functionally related. And oftentimes when reporting results or interpreting your data, it's much more useful to have them in the pathway format um, because then it's, you can see the direct relevance to uh, patients and to cellular systems. So these, these are just really two quick examples of what, you, what might be in store for you. If you're interested in doing transcriptomics analysis, this is, what, this is the kind of work that you could do um, to have direct therapeutic relevance for patients. And if you want to find more examples, there are a plethora of them available online. Um, I encourage you to go to uh, PubMed, which is the public repository from NIH of uh, published research, and you can go through these articles and, and find things that you're interested in. Uh, and if anyone wants to learn more about how to access PubMed, uh, I'm happy to send them some more details. I have a, a, a worksheet on that as well, and it should be up on our Semaway website. There should be a guide how to go through PubMed as well. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you so much, and I can take any questions now if there are any. And while we're waiting, I also want to add one quick note. I see that my mentor, Dr. Sudeshan Adas, is here on the call. Uh, I want to add a note of gratitude to her because everything that you see here in this presentation um, has been, it would, it wouldn't have been possible without her guidance. She's taught me how to do all of this, and she's mentored me over the past two years. Uh, so I'm really grateful to her for being my mentor and for guiding me. Uh, so I, I encourage you to reach out to your local universities, to experts in your field, and find a mentor. If, if you're really fortunate, you'll find a mentor like Dr. Das, uh, who is willing to support you and guide you at every step of the way. Let's see. Um, 
did you look at gene fusion events from RNA-seq data? Uh, I've, I actually haven't examined RNA-seq data um, in great detail. I've dabbled in it, but I haven't, I haven't analyzed RNA-seq data in, in great detail. I believe it is possible to look at gene fusion events, um, but I, I can't confirm that.